afternoon, everyone. It's fabulous to be here this afternoon uh, for our next instalment, um, an event for the Algae Innovation Challenge. So my name's Karen from Virtual Excursions Australia, and we're working with the Deep Green Biotech Hub um, to support the Algae Innovation Challenge. Um, We've had a little bit of a teacher introduction. We've had given some time and supplied lots of information to help you on your journey um, for your um, entrance in the Algae Innovation Challenge. And today we're just going to just give some extra information and ask, ask some questions um, with our fabulous um, panellists here from the Deep Green Biotech Hub and also Dr. Justin George, um, who's going to be providing extra information for us as well. So I'll just hand over for everyone to introduce themselves and um, yeah, we'll get started with some great information that will help you on your journey today. Hi there, my name is Melissa Oi. Uh, Rach and I are from the Deep Green Biotech Hub. Hi, um, as Melissa said, I'm Rachel. Um, and we work together for the Deep Green Biotech Hub in Sydney. Uh, and we get to work with scientists and innovators who are working on algae innovations every day. But we are so excited to be bringing um, this field into the classroom and see what the young entrepreneurs of the future um, can imagine. Hi, everyone. My name is Justin. I um, recently finished my PhD in algae biotechnology with climate change cluster at University of Technology, Sydney which is connected to the Deep Green Biotech Hub. So I know Rachel and Melissa from my time then. Uh, and since then, I've done a lot of work with um, really this joining um, biotechnology and design and also my work as an artist. So I do lots of different things, but mostly it's a lot of interdisciplinary thinking and um, teaching and research. I'm Ben Newsom from Physics Education, as well as Virtual Excursions Australia. And I must say, I'm really looking forward to seeing what people create in this challenge. So uh, over to you, Karen. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, and our goal for today is to really um, extend on what you have already um, begun. Hopefully you've been watching the videos that were supplied and you're getting some really good ideas. So we'll be looking at helping you along with that part of your journey today. I will um, talk a little bit about some of the cool stuff that I've kind of seen during my time in this space and talk to you a little bit about how we think about design um, kind of values in this sort of thing. So I think when we take on challenges like this algae innovation challenge, we often focus a lot on the science and the technical aspects, but we don't always think about the um, what that that technical thing or product or idea might, how it might exist in the world, who's going to interact with it, who's not going to get to interact with it because of the way we've designed it and we haven't maybe thought about them. Um, how will it be sustainable in the long run? Does it uh, address a, a specific problem well, or does it maybe create new problems that we hadn't thought about? So these are the kinds of ways we think about doing that with um, design thinking. Something, I'm just going to show you quickly a, a project that I saw very recently. I was a judge for the Biodesign Challenge, which is held in America, in New York. Um, in this competition, it's open to high school students and university students from all across the world. I think they had about 60 schools entering this year. And one of the projects that I saw, I thought was really strong. And I'm going to show you, it's got a little bit of algae in it, but um, what I'm really going to, what I think is really interesting about it and what we try to do a lot um, in the work that I do is bringing in narrative and storytelling, because that really helps us to contextualize the ideas that we're coming up with. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen. Great. Okay. If you can't, if you can't see that, just let me know. Um, so this is a, if you want to check it out, anyone is welcome to go to the biodesign challenge website and they've got hundreds of projects there that are really interesting and exciting to see. Um, and this is one of the projects. So I'm going to just show you what, what's really cool about the way they delivered it in the storytelling is they presented it like a podcast set in the future. And so they've set this um, podcast in 20, the year 2080, and they're reflecting back on 2030 and the Los Angeles arsenic crisis and this design that they came up with called Operation Porifera. And Porifera is a type of sponge. Um, and so I'm not going to have time to go fully into it. And you, I um, really encourage you guys to go and listen to the, the presentation and the, the, the fake podcast that they created. Um, but essentially they were looking at, they created, you know, this, um, they brought real research and then also they created 
um, their own kind of imagined news articles and science articles based on predictions that we know are possible in science. Um, so this idea of using this freshwater sponge um, periphera to uh, metabolize arsenic is a, is a real scientific feasibility. But then they speculated, they were imaginative about how to use that to clean water in, in Los Angeles. Um, and so if you look at the website, they'll show you, they do a little introduction here. Um, they talk about the, this issue of the arsenic poisoning, the, the 2020 Los Angeles arsenic crisis, which is all based on real evidence. This is footage, obviously, of supermarkets with COVID and um, supermarkets running out of water, for example. And unexpected here, then they, this is where they start talking about their ideas. So this is something you guys could think about. If you had an idea or a concept or for your project or for, your, for the challenge, how might you present it in an interesting way? Especially because if you think about it, you're designing for the future. Your idea doesn't exist today, which means it might exist in a future. And are you imagining a future that's very soon or one that's quite far away? Um, and so if we just, I'll just keep going down to show you, this is their kind of concept. So they've got this tank that keep, contains the, sp the sponge or um, houses the sponge that gets fed in with tap water in the house that's got arsenic contamination. Uh, the sponge can detoxify that water. They've supplied um, the sponge with some nutrients because of an algae little system at the top here, and then the people can get the um, fresh water. They've calculated some um, di uh, dimensions and um, specs around this design, and you can see that again here if you look at it a bit more closely. And then they started to also show it in interesting ways. So they said, okay, well, who wouldn't be able to have access to this? Um, for example, this looks like quite a high-tech, sophisticated instrument. How would that maybe be available to other communities that don't have necessarily have the same resources? Um, and so they came up with this idea of how to build your own system. And they showed this in this book, the different materials you'd need, things you could find around the house. And then they started to talk about the possibilities of um, that being in, in gen uh, other communities. Um, they, in this uh, fictional story that they talk about, they talk about these fictional activists who um, draw, really made this system to, um, work in the world. So originally they were saying, oh, you know, some scientists came up with this idea, but it wasn't really accessible. And really it was the grassroots activists that made the system work. Remember that this is all fictional. This is storytelling, but it's a way we can start to really contextualize and understand the ideas um, with, with storytelling. And so they've said, yeah. Just to interrupt, just a minute, that's yes. an awesome in-depth, I guess, who, what, well, I guess it started with the what, right? The problem yeah. of arsenic needing to be absorbed. And then you've got the scientific element by finding a natural sponge to take it up. And then you've got the why, I guess. And then the who, as in you moved from scientists now over to grassroots. Um, it's all those really basic design questions that have really been fleshed out in this whole narrative. Yeah, that right? exactly right. Yeah. Um, so that was just a quote. You can even do things like this to help flesh out your story. They came up with some quotes saying, the activists taught us how to create our own filtration system, mostly with household items we already had and gave us our own starter sponge. It has grown enough that we are planning to share it with our friends and neighbors. My daughter is fascinated by the sponge, which makes our water safe. She helps me take care of it every day. And this is just all really important for helping you to think about the transforming a technology into a, a real product or thing or design that, that has a place in the world. Um, so that's just one example I was going to share. I can always show some more, some more bits, but I might hand over back to, to the team. So um, now that we've got this detailed example of what kind of imaginative journey you can go on to really think about the who, what, why and how your innovative algae solution can grow a deep green future. Let's take a moment to just zoom out a little bit and think about what stage we're at and where we can zoom back in to really focus on what needs to happen next. So are you guys currently discovering algae, learning the biology, its history and its potential? Are you down and stuck into the who and why you're creating the kind of solution you're thinking about. Are you currently brainstorming the what? So what kind of problem you're trying to solve? Or are you defining how 
how your solution might solve that problem? Are you already practicing your pitch um, and your selling point for how this solution will work to grow a greener future? Or are you at the start, like a lot of, like I would be if I was doing this challenge and just starting to seek inspiration? Excellent. That's a really great place to to be thinking about as well where you are on that, you know, that journey, that continuum. So just, you know, just reflect on that as a, for a moment. We can discuss while you're thinking about that some of the pieces of information that we've supplied that can help you in all of those different stages. So remember, in the information we've supplied previously, it's got the idea of how to actually do a brainstorm and whether or not you're working as an individual or working in a group or as a whole class all of those things, um, you know, may put you on a different position in that journey as well. If you're just having your own ideas and you're following them all the way through, or if you're bouncing off your other classmates and it may be that it puts you in a different direction than you were originally thought. So it's a really great place. And all of the information that we've been providing in the videos and having our experts here today are going to help you in all of those different stages. So it's great for you to always go back to reflect to whereabouts you are on that journey. Can I add Can I something just... to that, Karen? Karen, sorry. Yes. Um, I think that it's really great to have that broken up, that journey, so that it's um, tangible to take on, so it's not very overwhelming. But it's also important to remember that it's not a linear journey, so you can sometimes move through it and then realize actually we need to go back to the who and the, uh, the who and why, or you go forward and you think, oh, wait, we've got to go back to the original starting question. That's very normal. Um, so don't be overwhelmed by that or feel scared or feel like you failed. That's if you are, if you are having to revisit things or, or if you feel like you're failing, that's a good sign that you're doing something new, that you're pushing yourselves and that you're being critical the whole way through something that's really important when you're trying to work with, um, any kind of living system, whether it's algae or a broader biodesign or trying to solve complex problems, which is usually what we're trying to do in the space, is to understand that there is no perfect solution. Unfortunately, a lot of the things we're trying to design for are what we call wicked problems, which means there isn't a solution, but we can only try and do things a little bit better. And so if we're going to be designing problems, uh, solutions that have built-in flaws, we need to show genuine awareness for those flaws um, and be really transparent and, and honest and humble about them. So that's totally okay if you have a system that isn't perfect. Even that sponge project that I showed has, has certain flaws and, and problems. You know, for example, they haven't really thought that much about how they would continuously culture the algae. What happens when it gets contaminated or it dies? What happens when it gets overgrown? That you know, they didn't show that in their design, and that's okay. But what will really strengthen your work is if you can show an awareness of the things you haven't solved or the problems that you think you might um, that you might bring up. Even something as small as, you know, they say that the, the person who designed the like button on Facebook, they intended it to really just be about spreading joy. And no one would have foreseen that it could uh, spread a huge amount of anxiety and um, social issues through this one simple button that was meant to be positive. So there's always complexities when we're trying to design things for our world, for people, for the environment. And it's really important that we bear that in mind and we're open and honest about it. And I just might add to that, Justin, I think with any, um, any sort of initiative that tries to improve the world, it's, it's a matter of doing it bit by bit rather than this like big, amazing world saving solution. Um, certainly in science, um, it's all about building on a body of knowledge. So, you know, um, scientists will publish their research, but they're very transparent about the limitations of their research or any flaws in their design. And then they make suggestions for what future, um, you know, future projects that people can work on to build their idea. So it's kind of all building towards this like collaborative thing and sharing mistakes and, and learning together as a community. Um, and yes, yeah, certainly in this challenge, we're not expecting um, perfect world saving ideas. It's all about having a go um, and yeah, imagining trying to rethink the way that we might do something um, to, to, to contribute to this sustainable future. It's um, yeah, we're not looking, you know, for a hero. 
I'll just maybe add one more thing to that um, and share my screen again. This is another project from that competition called um, the Biodesign Challenge. This was a, a group that did something called Dip Wrap. Um, and so that was exactly what Rachel was saying. They realized that to try and do a biodesign project um, that, that takes on plastics as a whole was way too overwhelming to think about all the different things that plastics afford us. Plastic is an incredible material that can do so many things. Um, and to try and replace it with uh, a single strategy was just far too overwhelming for them. So they took on one specific um, design challenge, and that was cucumbers, the plastic that cucum cucumbers come wrapped in, uh, the thermoplastic and the shrink wrap that, that they come in. And they just, throughout their project, did iterations of, of a um, kind of a, a bio-based solution to, to replace that plastic. And I think that's really um, important and, and a good um, reference point for the students here to think about where can we start small? What's something that we could uh, take on instead of over-promising and, and doing something that we call greenwashing, which is where, you know, there's a lot of promise about the um, something being totally sustainable or biodegradable, but really it isn't, or um, it's, a, it's a kind of marketing strategy, which is not something we want to promote here. And I guess this might actually be a good time then to jump into uh, and take a moment just to clarify what we're hoping to see from the challenge. So one of the things that we've discussed is that all algae ideas are welcome, that we're more than happy for you to start small and focus on one thing in your current life that you think could be more sustainable or benefited by algae technology or biodesign. So in similar fashion, we want you to show the knowledge that you have, the enthusiasm that you have for a certain thing that's going on in your life and to learn to be able to speak clearly about your green ideas. And in this challenge, what we hope for you to do is to develop three key skills. And that's the sort that those three skills are what we're going to be looking for in your pitch, pitch presentations. The three key skills are innovation, application and communication. And the pitch packs that speak most to those themes will be nominated to be finalists for the showcase on Friday, 20th of August. And the pitch packs and the live presentations that speak the most to each of those three criteria will win, um, will each be voted as either most innovative, most applicable or best communicated ideas. So we really want you to lean into your strengths we really want you to start and um, hone in on a solution that's clear to you. If you're creative, we want you to show us the most original, innovative idea. If you're a hard scientist, teach us about how well thought out your solution is and how it might work in the real world. If you're a great communicator, shine for us and build the slickest presentation and clearly describe your problem, your idea and, and the benefit to the wider world. Um, don't yeah there's no need to feel like you have to solve solve the problems of the world um just start start small find your space um and hone in on what your natural strengths are excellent um thanks melissa and i'd really like to echo um what everyone has been saying as well some of these issues that you can be looking at can be really small you know it's the the classic saying sort of you know think globally, act locally. And, you know, trying to solve all of the big problems of the world can be, you know, overwhelming. So pulling apart and picking down to some of those smaller things that may be more achievable could be a great place for you to start. And you never know where that journey will take you. And you may end up with a big, big idea, but it started from something small. And another thing to uh, remember as well is to pull um, and create your team across your school. So you may have been looking at this in um, from science class or technology, um, but also if you want someone to help you maybe film your video or help get someone from one of the design students that might be able to help with your 
your slides or the presentation, you know, use all of those amazing tools and expertise that you have in your, you know, your friends and your cohort and your class and your year group um, across your school to help you create these pitch events as well. You know, science is always such a collaborative process. Um, and sometimes you need all of those amazing people around you. Or oh, one more thing I think that's important to say is that your idea doesn't have to be a thing or a product. It can also be a system. Um, or, a, or a kind of process. And so I'm going to show an example of that as well. This is um, some of my students from my biodesign class this year. They were looking at, um, this isn't algae specific, but it is about genetically engineered organisms and um, or genetically modified organisms. Um, I Part of my project, as I said, doing algae biotechnology was to genetically engineer algae to produce um, chemicals that are naturally found in plants that we use as medicines. Um, the plants make them in way too little amount and it's too expensive and complicated to extract them from plants. So that's why we try to put the gene for those um, chemicals or those medicines into algae and, and make them like that. Um, so this, this group was thinking about genetic engineering and thinking about, they started to realize, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of, it, historically there's been a lot of contention around genetically engineered food. And they started to think about um, the goal of, of genetic engineering in food, which is around sustainability. But a lot of other um, initiatives around food have also got sustainability goals. So things like being organic is, is a lot around sustainability. Um, things like permaculture, locally sourced foods, vegan and vegetarian food, all of these things share um, in this image, you can see they all share the same agenda of being sustainable. But we don't often see, think of them working together or connecting. We actually often think of them being opposite. So, for example, organic food and genetically modified food, we think of as being polar opposites. And so this project was about, it's not a thing or a product, but it's a kind of system or concept. They came up with the idea of a restaurant that was about sustainability, but that um, looks at all these different processes that come together for sustainability. And so I'll just show you some of, um, this is the idea of some of their social media that they designed around it. What I think is really interesting, though, is the, the menus that they created. I'm just going to show you some of them. One of the items on the menu here is a crispy pumpkin and cricket risotto. And the cricket there is an is a, um, insect or a bug that's eaten in many parts of the world um, because it's a, a very high protein, um, low carbon emitting uh, kind of animal or, or uh, insect um, or, or source of protein, rather. But it's not something that is often seen in Western uh, restaurants or, or on menus. And so that was a really interesting uh, thing that they put on this menu. And essentially, this menu is all about putting in all those things together that contribute to sustainability. So they also have, for example, house-baked sourdough, and they've described it out as a drought-resistant wholemeal grain sourdough served with oven-baked olives and balsamic glaze. Um, and that would be a genetically modified grain that's been genetically engineered to be drought resistant. But we don't often see these um, genetically engineered crops or, or um, food products uh, referenced this way on menus. Um, they also had this nice little scale system here with the, um, the, little, the little leaves showing how sustainable um, each uh, uh, item on the restaurant is. Um, and then they even started using genetic engineering words, things like promoters and terminators. These have to do with genes. Doesn't matter if you don't understand it, but it's just showing that they were being very creative with um, science communication and um, visual languages as well in, in, um, in a kind of design and biotechnology innovation capacity. So that was the last thing I just wanted to show. That's Justin, awesome. I think um, we should just absolutely take advantage of the fact that we have you with us today um, and that you have, you know, such an interesting background um, and, you know, so much knowledge and experience in, you know, not only working with, well, innovating with biology, which is what this challenge is all about. Um, and I just wanted to ask you a couple of, well, you know, start asking you some questions. Um I, I would like to know what you find most exciting about the potential of innovating with um, algae in particular, what you think is the most promising um, sort of possibilities. Yeah, that's a really tough question. I think um, I'm always really much more excited about thinking 
about the unexpected and the, the things that people do with things once we put them out in the world. So scientists and designers will spend a huge amount of time making things and developing new technologies and then putting them out in the world only to find that people and societies use them in totally unexpected ways, not always in a bad way, often in a very good way, um, often in ways that are not intended, but uh, interesting things end up having a cultural significance and, and status that you never thought would have a certain type of status or, or um, um, yeah, kind of inference but with people and emotions. So I'm really interested to see uh, algae in the world and, and how people start interacting with things and start doing things in their own ways once more people of the, of, you know, the general public, non-scientists, are given this, this kind of thing to, to interface with. So if you think, for example, of um, anything, you know, like uh, um, uh, the mugs and plates, you know, crockery in your house, if you, everyone is very comfortable with these items, even if we don't necessarily know how they get made, you know, the clay or the firing processes or where they've even come from, everyone has a um, experience with these materials and will repurpose them in all sorts of ways, maybe as a, you know, for growing a plant in or, breaking them and making a mosaic. Um, and so I'm really interested to start seeing what that looks like, what happens when we have a better relationship with these tiny invisible um, organisms that we don't see with our eyes, but we can see the, the impacts of them or, or grow them in big um, cultures and, and start to see what they, the things that they can do. Um, so for example, I, I once was in the lab just messing around and I looked at some of my algae and I could see it was moving around in, in re relationship to the light. And so I video recorded it to see what it would look like. And I thought I put lights on one side and I watched, I thought that they'd all move from the dark side to the light side. When I watched the recording, I realized at first it looked like nothing happened and I was a little bit disappointed, but then I looked really closely and I saw that they were moving from the dark to the light side, but in this really interesting dancing sort of pattern. And I showed it to a choreographer a friend of mine who was very inspired by it. And we ended up having lots of discussions about, movement and and <clears throat> relationships between human and non-human and these are the kinds of things that I'm really excited by and interested in so I think technology and the things we can develop and all the affordances it can bring is exciting but I'm never really convinced on the solutions alone because we've had we've been promised solutions by science for decades for um you know many many years and those solutions have often brought more problems and that's something that we need to be really cognizant of. So what I'm really excited about with the um, kind of bio revolution and the algae um, innovation and that kind of thing is what does that look like when we include more people who are not usually giving their voice in the space, people who are more marginalized um, and, and people who are not scientists, because I think we can have much more interesting um, ideas and solutions. I guess that kind of touches on that idea of not trying to design a perfect solution or a perfect sort of idea. Um, just to kind of veer off a little bit off of that, what do you personally find to be the hardest part of the design sort of uh, like process? Because you were talking about how we move back and forth between different stages of um, di different stages of the design process. So what do you find most challenging? But also, I guess, what do you find helps or what do you do to kind of push past those sorts of yeah. things? So I think there's lots of difficult parts. One of the first ones is we tend to have an idea straight away that we like and we want to do and we, we want to hold on to that idea, um, especially if you're working in a group, for example, students here might be working in a group, you might have a really cool idea and you want everyone in your group to do your idea. And sometimes... Uh, quite often, our first idea is not a very good idea. Um, often, I think what I tell my students is get all your ideas out now because a lot of them are the bad ideas and that's great. Get them out, put them aside so we can move past them. So the first thing that's quite difficult is getting over our attachment to our initial ideas and being, I guess, one of the ways you can do that is be being excited and open to the process of what, what you might discover with this group of people and, and with yourself by, by putting those things aside. You can always come back to them, um, but it's really good to not focus in on one idea, your first idea. Uh, I think what else is also difficult is sometimes 
um, wh where to start. So sometimes people want to start with the pro a, a specific problem and they have a clear problem they want to work with, which is sometimes, you know, a bit easier. Sometimes people are not sure of a problem, so they start exploring possibilities and, and concepts and ideas, but then struggle to connect it to a, a purpose or a problem. Um, so where to start is difficult. And one of my solutions to that as well is try to start, say, three different things in three different ways. So start one thing with a problem. What is the problem? Let's choose a problem, even if it's not a problem we want to do. Maybe you really don't want to do um, packaging and plastics, but say we're going to do that. And what? how are we going to build an idea from that? Start another idea that's going to be about the people. So where is, uh, for example, the who? Who is the people we're trying to cater for? Is this something you're doing in your family or in your community? Is it for a community that you're not a part of? And if it's not, have you spoken to them to understand why you've chosen to do it for them? And then you can start from another one, maybe something really weird and imaginative. Like, And actually, my students who did that restaurant project, they did something like that. So they were saying, what if we could... Um, do something with, with food where we could represent like the, an enzyme lock and key. So they were saying, what if we had one flavor and another, so a flavor of say a strawberry and a flavor of a banana, and they come together in a lock and key mechanism like enzymes, and then they make a new flavor and that jump started other ideas for them, but that didn't really have any kind of purpose. It was just a weird idea. So I would encourage the students to, to try three different, start at three different stages. Um, <clears throat> lots of ideas is good because a lot of ideas are, are not good ideas. So get lots out and then, and then walk away and start developing some, um, take a break from it. So if you're feeling stuck, it's good to just walk away. Sometimes you, you forget, but your brain is actually still thinking about ideas uh, subconsciously when you're not thinking about them. So you might take a break and you go for a walk with your dog or, or watch a movie or watch the news and suddenly something comes to you. Um, that's, a, that's a really good process. So if you feel stuck, take a break. Um, yeah, that's, that's a few of them. And then I think if you get to a point where you have an idea that's not, you know, you, you, you've moved quite far and your, your, your thing is due and you haven't quite, um, you're not totally loving it or you're not totally passionate about it. That's okay too. just try and do a good job of it and think about why it's not strong and share that. You know, we were really excited to explore this area, but we ended up realizing that we just couldn't solve any of the issues because it's super complex for all these reasons. That's very, very useful research. A whole chapter in my PhD thesis is about that, basically. Things I try to do that couldn't work and why it doesn't work and why it's difficult for other people. And that's important information too. Those are awesome tips. Yeah, and awesome life lessons as well. Thank you so much, Jester. Algae is ancient, so over 2.5 billion years old. So if you think that algae could speak and that it could speak to us today, what do you think it might say? Yeah, I think it would say, like, how could you have forgotten us? You know, we were the beginning. And how, how can you be so crazy to think that just because you can't see us, we don't matter? Um, how, how are you not thinking about us every single day? You know, you're thinking about just looking all the time for inspiration and, and things that are beautiful, but here we are and you're not looking at us or talking to us or looking at all the amazing things that we can do. Uh, so I think that they'd be pretty shocked at how self-centered we are as humans and how focused we are on our scale instead of the, the macro or the micro scale. Yeah, because from what we learned, they can dance as well. Yeah, beautifully actually, yeah. So, okay, everyone, we've had some amazing information that's come through to us today. And this is all helping to build on everything we've supplied. So don't forget um, to re-watch some of the videos that have been supplied. Um, you know, keep looking back at some of the um, teacher resource packs that are for you as well. Um, and as you can see, there's inspiration that you can get from all over the place. So, you know, don't, don't limit yourself to sort of one direction. And I think, you know, it's really important to remember if you get stuck, have a break. It's really important. It's, you know, all the time, you know, I might be taking the dog for the walk or doing something like that. And I have my best ideas because it's, it's all in there. And sometimes it just needs a little bit of time and space to sort of the idea to come to the surface. So I think um, it's always important to have those breaks if you are getting a little bit stuck as well. Um, so we'll get this 
uh, information out to you um, in the video shortly as well, so you can uh, look back on it as well. Um, and our next key timelines are going to be the 13th of August, and that's when your pitch packs are due to be submitted. Um, so I think we've got it closing um, late, late in the evening um, to give you plenty of time to work on it as well, and for those of you that are interstate and in different time zones to get your results in as well. Um, so make sure that you've got um, your slides, um, your title, your blurb, um, and your video ready to go. Um, we'll be having a really quick turnaround on those, and we'll be letting the finalists uh, know early the following week. Um, and then it will be the 20th of August um, that will be the finalists an opportunity to, um, yeah, to pitch their ideas to the panellists. And we'll have Justin with us again um, on that panel uh, to help judge our finalists. Um, and remembering um, all of the people that have registered for the program are welcome to come to that and view that as well. So even if your idea wasn't one of the ones that uh, was chosen to be a finalist, you are still welcome to join us in that event um, and see what some of the finalists were. Um, so really great to get inspiration for next year as well. So I'll just pass you back to with Melissa just to have a couple of things to think about um, as your journey continues to the 13th of August. Yeah, I guess, thanks, Karen. Um, just as a closing remark, uh, more important than developing those three key skills around our uh, application, innovation, and communication, we just really want you to have fun and practice designing solutions, not solutions, what did we say? Designing your ideas, ideas, ideas. ideas for, a greener, for a greener future. Um, and if you're stuck or if you're in the brainstorming phase, maybe a couple of things that might be fun for you to think about just to kind of get the creative juices flowing. Uh, what are three things you learn about, you've learned about algae? Or what are three things you love about algae now that you, you watch the videos, you've listened to this talk, you've, you've seen the sorts of possibilities uh, algae innovation could take the world to? Um, or... What are the biggest and smallest problems algae could address? So yeah, thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you so much to Justin for sharing with us the experience of the design process, uh, things we've learned so much today. So uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. And um, we will see you again soon. And just remember, at any time you've got further questions, just email through to Virtual Excursions Australia and we will um, help support you throughout your journey, whether it's about logistics or it's about um, where you can find further information. We are here to help you and support you on your journey. And just to echo what everyone else has said today, it is all about having fun as well. Um, you know, see, see how you go. Enjoy the process process, enjoy the project um, and enjoy your journey. Um, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye.